Hi, I'm Joe. And I'm Dave. And we're the hosts of the Chasing Tomorrow podcast, where we bring you stories that delve into the science and spirit behind intriguing people doing extraordinary things. This week on episode 12 of the Chasing Tomorrow podcast, we have Pete Kostelnik. Now, Pete, I've always been told that uh, you should never, ever meet your heroes. My life goal when it comes to running is to break the Trans-Canadian speed record. So that's uh, 72 days across Canada, 7,200 kilometers. Pete Kostelnik is my hero. And not only uh, do I have I ever met him, we're good friends. And Pete has the Transcon speed record. That's running all the way from San Francisco to New York City in 42 days, six hours, and 30 minutes. That's a mind-numbing 73 miles per day on average. You know, just just let, let that get through your head for a second. He's also got the, uh, well, I think he's the only person to ever run the Key to Key, which is Key, Alaska to uh, Key, Florida, uh, unsupported. That was... 5,300 miles in uh, 98 days, I believe, I believe. He's a two-time two -time Badwater champion. He's the fifth fastest uh, North American 24-hour time ever with uh, 163.5 miles run in 24 hours. 32 years old, sponsored by Hoka. I'm, I'm super happy to introduce you to Pete Kostelnik. Pete, how are you doing, buddy? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, how how was that introduction? How was that? It was good. I wish you, I wish I could have like uh, put the sentences in between your sentences about the whole hero and you know guy that's run over 160 miles in 24 hours because you've done pretty much everything I've done. So well, you 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 know <laughs> when it comes to the transcon and when it comes to the key to key, you know you have you have definitely put your your money where your mouth is. And uh, yeah, I I you know I'm super happy that. Uh, you know, you and I have become as good friends, and you supported me through the Trans Canadian Speed Record attempt a couple years ago. And uh, yeah, no, it's awesome having you on the call here today. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited. Yeah, Pete. So, um, of course, uh, most people have a hard time wrapping their head around what you do, right? And in some ways, you you probably think you're somewhat of a normal guy, but you know, you can you can endure like very few. So maybe. Let's start just a little bit with, you know, how did you find your way into wanting to run across the country? Uh, you know, did you start as a runner in high school, ultra running later on? You know, tell us just a little bit of the story of Pete Kostelnik. Yeah, you know, I, um, you know, I didn't really run much at all. Like I was always fascinated by um, hiking. Um, so like I, when I was a kid, like, you know, I grew up in Iowa where it's like <laughs> flat and cornfields and there's no mountains. So um, every, every summer, uh, my family and I, we, I was, I'm the youngest of five. So we, we never flew anywhere. We always drove places because that's what you do with a family of seven uh, in a, packed in a van. And so we would go out to Colorado a lot. We would go out to um, California too. And um, I just remember like, you know, it's kind of funny that like two of the like first ultras that I really wanted to do when I got into ultra running were Leadville and Badwater because like I had, those were like my two favorite things that actually got me into running before. Like, it, it's just a weird circle. Like I was out there when I was just a little kid hiking these 14,000 foot mountains. Um, and I didn't really have any concept of like what running was. And I remember when I was hiking um, in Colorado with my uncle uh, one summer, he, he said, I should do cross country. And I was like, what's cross country? And so, um, you know, I, it took me a few years later to actually sign up for it, you know, towards the end of high school. Um, so it's funny that, you know, already that kind of ultra mindset was in my mind before I was ever even a, a runner. And I just, so I, I've always, you know, had a passion for just nature and, seeing cool things and I think um that's what a lot of the stuff that I, I've tried to do is like even if I'm even if I'm running on road I want it to be like a meaning a meaningful um experience and then you know even from from that I've just gotten so fell, fallen in love with ultras over the last 10 years so much that I'll even do you know a boring 
24 hour race or six day race around the loops because it's just kind of my my passions just kind of meandered through that but that was where it all kind of started for me I was never much of a runner in high school and um, I didn't run in college I just was just a casual runner until um, I started doing marathons and then I just um, kind of as a dare I did a 44 mile ultra um, when I like about uh, 10 years ago and that was really kind of what made me fascinated by the extremes. Well, and I think Pete, like, you know, taking your answer, what you just said there and, 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 you know, the runner's mindset and then what you do is two very different things, I think. And, you know, it, it makes sense to me that when you were a child, you were, you were a hiker, um, you were a meanderer, right? And so if, if you don't mind me jumping in and saying, Hey Pete, when I watch you run, um, you don't get intense and you don't, you don't, you don't want to rip things apart. You're kind of just meandering uh, in your mind and, and getting from a point A to point B. Now I've done that. Now I need to go to the, this next place. Or like you said, those one mile loops for six days, you just, you break everything down into meaningful chunks and you, you go ahead and do that. Um, do you think that, that, you know, maybe your, your, your upbringing with, with, you know, being involved in hiking has really kind of set you forward on being as excellent of a multi-week runner, maybe, you know, the world's best multi-week runner. Um, do you think that that maybe has set you forward in, in that path? Yeah. And, and you know, the, the, like I was talking, the, the road trips, the endless car rides, you know, I, I became uh, very patient at a very young age, which is very hard to come by these days, I think. Um, so, and, and I mean, it, it is kind of a joke, but it is, I mean, I think that is, part is like if I'm working on a very I don't know like I've, I've always noticed that I can always work through a very like not necessarily monotonous but just very um like just a very like ongoing task like no matter if it's playing like a video game with, with my friends like you know through like for 12 straight hours like mm -hmm. I can just kind of zone into something for a very long time and that um not get bothered by it. So I think that's what, um, and, and not get ahead of myself, not get like, like whenever I'm doing these races, if I'm having a good race, it's because I'm, you know, staying back and not getting too ahead of myself and just staying, keeping my mind um, fresh and um, not, you know, not getting over it, overly excited about anything. <laughs> Yeah, and so what I hear there is it's almost like it's a learned skill um, that you've ended up developing when you were a child, and now you're implementing as as an adult, um, 32 years old, I think. And um, you know, it's it's a very odd and different skill set where it's having enough patience um, to do those monotonous activities over and over and over and over and over again. Was there any one moment when you were a kid when you could even go back to hiking with your uncle or something that your parents said or friends? Uh, was there any one moment that you think that was maybe a bit more of a flashbulb moment when you were a kid that, that kind of set this 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 mindset moving forward? Yeah, you know, I think, um, yeah, you know, when, when I, like, I just loved um, the element of pushing yourself to continue to improve as well. Like, whenever, I remember, you know, we would go out, and I mean, I guess that's kind of across all you know, all distances of running, but I think in particular with ultra running is, you know, we, when you're running like a 10 K, yeah, you might shave off a minute, two minutes or three minutes. But when I started doing hundred milers, my first hundred miler took me over 28 hours and I've cut over half of that time off. I've cut 14 hours. And I mean, there are different courses, but I think just that, you know, it's with ultra running, it's like every day, you know, I'm getting, if I get, you know, 1% better today, that's a very tangible result. If I, you know, am really being methodical about my next race, if it's, you know, hundred miles or something like that. So um, I think just, just like with, with like when we would go hiking in Colorado, we would maybe do the same mountain um, a few summers in a row. And just like, you know, two years ago, Oh, it took me eight hours to get to the top. Now it took me six, like just things like that. So um, I think, you know, you can, in, in ultra running, that's the thing that's really cool to me is like, you can improve far more, I think, than any other sport. And so that's, that's something I've always, I've always 
took taken a lot of pride in is improvement, not necessarily the end result. Yeah, and you know, so the, the sport of ultra running has a couple of interesting dimensions because one is there are organized races, and then we have these FKTs where we can fastest known times, you know, in our own way create something. And so you've gone from some of the classic ultras. I mean, certainly Badwater is a is a pretty wicked race. I saw the other day that it was 142 degrees in Death Valley. I think it might be the hottest it's ever been. So good thing you weren't there then. Uh, but yeah, so did you do a lot of the organized uh, ultras before you started, you know, trying something like Transcon? Yeah, I didn't. Um, I didn't try that many. Um, but yeah, I did. Like, you know, I did, you know, I did Battle Water a couple times. I did, I think I did probably about a dozen hundred mile races. So yeah, I definitely wasn't... Um, I wasn't as experienced as most people are that go to um, doing some of these FKTs. Like I'm thinking like, um, you know, you look at someone like Scott Jurek or right. Speed Goat, you know, they were, mm. I, I mean, Speed Goat had probably won five times as many hundreds as I had even attempted. Right. He did the um, Appalachian Trail. So yeah, I think, you know, I, I was a pretty, I had, I had pretty, you know, small, a sh pretty short resume going into, um, you know, my first, because, because actually I did do, um, you know, I did the two transcons in 2016 and 2018. Um, but I did also did do a run across Iowa, um, which was a week long, about 400 and some miles, um, when I was, let's see, in 2013. And that, I mean, that was, that was like two years into doing ultras. So yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I had a passion for the FKTs um, almost immediately when um, when I started getting into ultras. And did you did you kind of figure that um, that you had a very so I, th I think the one thing a lot of ultra runners do because ultra running is again you have fifty kilometers fifty miles then you end up having you know road twenty four hours or track twenty four hours and you have these mountainous you know hard rocks that are you know impossibly uh, impossible to run but, but really hard to even hike but then you have these multi-week adventures that you do and, and you know Pete the thing I see about you is that you're incredibly event specific um, and that the multi-week contests is that's where you eat that's where you do your very best um, did you seem to think that at the very beginning of your ultra running career you kind of knew that your 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 mindset or, or your skill sets really allotted well to the multi-week events yeah, I, th I think so. And I think it, a lot of it is with the way I train. Um, you know, I do, I do put myself through probably, I, I will admit, maybe more miles than I have to um, for the traditional like racing, even like racing, you know, 100 miles or even 24 hours, I probably put in more miles than I need to. Um, and then, you know, but although for like six days and like multi days, I think, you know, I'm, I'm maybe about where I should be. I just um, maybe haven't gone into those, those types of races as fresh as I probably should have in hindsight. But I think it is like, you know, the doing 100, you know, 150 mile training weeks, I think has really benefited me because it, I think maybe one of the biggest obstacles to the multi week, um, runs that I've done is the ability to uh the ability to just recover very quickly like you know you, you don't if you're doing 50 miles a day every day you know those 50 miles are going to take you at least you know seven or eight hours probably you know more like 10 with some breaks in there so you're really only getting like 14 hours of recovery so I mean that's one of the crazy things is like you know you do a, a hundred mile race. And then you, even if you, Oh, I only took two days off, but you know, you had, you know, 36 hours to recover as opposed to, you know, like 14, if you're doing what I was, you know, talking about the 50 miles a day. So I think that's a, I think that's a big piece. I think that's, I think, you know, when I did uh, key to key from Alaska to Florida, um, doing 55 miles a day, I actually, my fitness level really wasn't that great, but I had a, a lot of confidence in my um, my uh, ability to recover, and I think that's 
really what kind of got me through that run. Yeah, I want to I want to touch base on that recovery in a second, but before we do that, I I, I love that you're so humble, Pete, um, and and I, I feel like I might be one of the the few that could call you out on that um, as well too, because um, I'm a high mileage guy as well too, and I couldn't agree more when it comes to the recovery. You know, the 140, 160 mile weeks, you can't beat it, and there are very few people in the world that are doing it. But you know, I put in big miles like you. Um, no, I don't put in the miles that you do though. And there's no one in the world that runs like Pete Kostelnik. So I remember there was one year, and I think it was 20, 2018 or 2016. No, it was 2016. And I think over the entire year, the 365 days, you averaged 26 miles a day. Is that right? Uh, yeah, well, actually, you, you, you caught me because um, <laughs> in 2018, I, I made a big deal because, like, at the end of the year, uh, I, I knew like going into my run from Alaska to Florida, cause just because it was over 5,000 miles in you know, three months that I was probably going to be close to 10,000 at the end of the year. So I, I did get to over 10,000 miles that year. Um, and, but then two years before that, um, in 2016, I, when I did the, you know, 3000 mile transcon, um, in, you know, a month and a half, I, I think I came, I, I didn't know it at the time, but I came up like, I think it's like a couple hundred miles short of 10,000. And so like, <laughs> like I was joking with a friend, like around New Year's was like, yeah, you know, I, if I would have known I was, you know, that close, maybe I would have, but it was probably good that I didn't, you know, try to try to get it as well. But yeah, I, I have had a couple of years where I was averaging basically like a mar marathon a day. <laughs> right. And people talk, Pete, you know, in the, in the running community, like people talk about, you know, guys like yourself and say, oh, you know, that's too much. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's just too heavy. There's no way you can recover from that. You know, Pete's going to be walking like he's 75 years old when he's 40, um, on and so forth. Um, I'm sure you've heard it all. But, you know, in my opinion, Pete, when you're wanting to live on the razor's edge and be the world's best at something, and you are right now the world's best multi-week runner by far, um, you got to take those risks and live on, on the razor's edge. You can recover like nobody else. And everybody also speak at, at a distance about it, um, about, hey, what you should be doing and screaming from the cheap seats. But you're living right in the center of the arena. And so right now, you feel that... Um, this is the question, Pete, is, is right now you feel that your training, you know, you know, schedule 10,000 miles a, a month, a, a year, and that just blow, knocks my socks off even just thinking <laughs> I'm going to come up a little short this year. <laughs> you might come up, yeah, I would hope that you end up having uh, uh, off years, but, but would you say that that's, that's maybe one of the keys to your success? What's, well, sorry. What, what, Recovery. Yeah. 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 Oh, like, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. So tell, tell absolutely. us about your recovery when it comes to, to racing and, and training. When it comes to 10,000 miles, you know, Joe's just shaking his head right now, 10,000 miles uh, a, a year. Um, tell us about your recovery. So when you're not running, what are you doing? Um, you know, I'm, well, I, I have a desk job, so I'm, I'm <laughs> sitting in front of a computer most days. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't do, I don't do anything that crazy. That's the thing. Like, I don't, um, I don't really use like many, um, many of your typical um, like re recovery, like, you know, machines or anything like that. Um, I, I'm very intentional though about the timing of like, you know, if I get done with a 20 plus mile run, I am usually having some sort of protein, like a protein drink, you know, just like, I, I like those like protein packs. I think it's like pure protein or something. And like, I just throw that in a water bottle and drink it, you know, immediately as I'm getting done with my run. Cause I, I think that's a big part of it. Um, I, I have noticed that if I don't do something like that, you know, within 30, 40 minutes of getting done with running, like if I go home and, and cook a meal, even if it's like a nice healthy meal full of protein, um, or if I, you know, wait to go out to eat later, um, you know, that that's the big thing. I mean, it's really simple things, but I'm just very, I'm very, uh, I, I don't skip them ever. Like um, when, like when I was running from Alaska to Florida, a lot of times if I had someone that, you know, wanted to say, you know, like, oh, hey, you, when you're done running, you know, do you want to go out to eat with me? And usually I would tell, I mean, I, usually I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll go out to eat with you, but I'll just have a beer because I'm going to eat, you know, right when I get done running. I'm not going to go shower, walk 20 minutes to 
some establishment and wait another 30 minutes to get food. So mm-hmm. things like that, like just, just staying very calculated, not, you know, I don't do really more than one, if any, um, harder workouts in a week. So, you know, sometimes I'll go longer than I should without doing a more intense workout, but, uh, I have noticed sometimes when I, I try to squeeze too much quality running in, I, I kind of set myself back sometimes. So tell us like a couple things. And so what's a typical day and then a typical week? Like, so you wake up, you run or where, how do you just give us a typical day and then how do the seven days evolve? Yeah. Um, like just in normal training. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I usually do, um, although this week, like I've just been all out of sorts. I've been running uh, at night a few, a few times this week, but usually I, uh, wake up early. Um, I like to do, I mean, I've been trying to get in like 15 to 20 miles, um, most days during the week. So, um, you know, wake up at 5 AM run from, five you know sometimes i can get running like within 10 20 minutes of waking up yeah um get running uh get done you know around 8 a.m and work and then i do like to do like a walk i do i do a lot of walking like not like for hours on end but i do like to you know in the evenings if i can get like two three miles of walking just around my neighborhood because i think it's good to not be you know sedentary for more than you know eight hours at all yeah. so i try to kind of break up the days that way so then you eat breakfast after you finish your run in the morning so you run fasted in the morning yeah usually i have like an omelet or, or eggs or something for breakfast that's that's usually that's been my go-to lately it, it kind of satisfies me till lunch and it you know i think that's you know having that quality protein and, and fat yeah is good because i've noticed that if i go on a long run if i just eat something like heavy in carbs i'm just going to be you know i I, i'm sure you guys like you'll you'll just be hungry in like two hours (laughs) Mm -hmm. oh yeah i know know you know and then uh and so you do each day you'll run say 15 to 20 miles and then there are a couple days the weekend days do you do more than that distance then yeah yeah on the weekends i like to stretch it out usually um if I can, you know, some weekends, like if we're traveling or doing something else, I'll actually just kind of ramp down the miles. But, um, I do like to do, um, you know, you know, a lot of weekends I'll be doing like a, it's not, it's not, uh, it's pretty normal that I'll do like a 30 to 40, sometimes even more training run. Um, usually I I try to save like this year, I haven't been doing too many, like I ha- I do like to do some like 50, 60 mile training runs sometimes too. Um, maybe even like 70 sometimes if I'm getting really serious about um, like a transcon coming up. So, you know, I haven't really, you know, thanks to COVID, I haven't really had to worry about putting my body through that this year. So, you know, I've kind of been saving my longer efforts, but yeah, I, I, I love to do those, you know, 40 to 60 mile uh, training runs on the weekend and, and sometimes even do like, you know, do like a 50 miler on a Saturday and then, um, you know, do another two hours of really easy, uh, running on Sunday, just to kind of force my body to get into that, um, get into that groove of quick, rapid recovery. Yeah. And so about 140 to 160 miles a week, is it what you're averaging? Yeah, that's what I've been trying to get to. I've I've had a couple hip things going on this year and you know, it's it's probably not the worst thing in the world knowing that there's just not that much racing going on anyways, but um yeah, I do yeah, I I used to like in I think maybe two or three years ago I was I was actually hitting some 200 mile like cons- weeks pretty consistently and I I do think that was a little over um if for doing like if I you can't do that like all the time and just expect yourself to to be fresh and I, I paid the price in 2017 with my, my racing was just terrible that year mm-hmm. um, but I do think it's it's useful for like getting ready for you know a multi-day event I think so and, and you know really ultimately multi-week so um so Pete let's let's jump into that because I think that we've been skirting around the topic of of 
you know, the Transcon uh, speed record and then the key to key. Um, you know, Transcon, you were running 73 miles a day for 42 days in a row. Um, you know, you took one day off, didn't you? You took one day off. Yep, yep. Day so seven. the mileage was a bit higher than that. But then, of course, you took the one day off and then you recovered like a champ. And, and, and Slacker, and, right? Just, yeah, slacker, right? <laughs> and then, of course, the key to key was, you know, you pushing a, a baby stroller essentially down the highway <laughs> from the northern <laughs> tip of, 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 uh, of North America down to the southern tip of, well, close to well, in, in Florida. So Dave, Dave, let's talk about... For, for our viewers, if you haven't seen this, you got to look on Google and look up Pete and the, the key to key and see him pushing this baby stroller. And you just sort of wonder, what's this guy doing? Like, has he kidnapped someone? And <laughs> <laughs> In the middle of nowhere, up to all throughout the Alaskan highway and stuff. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Crazy. No, sorry, anyway. No, no, no. But let's go on about kind of the day to day there. So, hey, 150 miles. Um, that sounds really impressive. But let's talk about, you know, 450 to 500 miles a week, week after week after week uh, across um across america and then of course across north america with the key to key so so tell us more about the day-to-day -day there um maybe walk us through a day when it comes to the life of peak Austin, like during the transcon yeah yeah it was so you know they were so different um that's the thing like so the first one um the first one was all about getting rid of any any error like um because because really day seven was was really like the reason of when I, when I took a full day off was kind of the, I'll, I'll call it like the penalty for error, mostly on my part. Um, so like when I started that transcon, you know, the goal, you know, the record that I was going after, I think was like an average of 67, 66 or 67 miles per day. And so I thought, okay, if I can average 70 to 72 miles a day, that'll be perfect. And that, and that was like the goal, but I was just kind of like, well, if it has to be, you know, it, it, I, my, my main thing was on the route was I did not want to um, stake out. I wanted to, for whatever reason, I don't know why I just thought, well, if I can just save the time from having to like stake out somewhere, you know, like literally put like a stake in the ground with a flash flashing light on it and then go drive to a, to like a hotel or something. Like I didn't want to have to do that and I knew it was going to be very unlikely, but we actually did. Um, we were able to do that uh, the whole way through. So I, I slept in the RV on the side of the road, sometimes like in a very tight window of real estate. Um, <laughs> but um, that was, and that's what kind of caused the issues early on was um, I was kind of just ambiguous about how many miles I wanted to do per day. And so the first couple of days ended up being over 80 miles. Um, and then day three in Yosemite, uh, or Yosemite National Park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, um, I, I, I didn't do the math on how much elevation gain there is coming from the West into Yosemite. And long story short, you end up starting at like 2000 feet in finishing the day at 10,000 feet. And it was just a very hard day. And it, even though it wasn't quite 80 miles, that was where I, I had already screwed up. And the next three days, I was really just kind of managing pain until we took a day off on day seven. And so we quickly realized that our routine wasn't right. And so like from there all the way to New York City, or at least until the last day, um, we were very, very strict about being 70 to 73 miles a day. And, and maybe, I think there was a couple of days where it might've been like 74 or five, but it was, you know, not, no, no more 80 miles, Pete, you know, you got it. So like, that was basically it. And it was just a very, very calculated wake up at the same time every day, wake up 10 minutes earlier, you know, to make up for a new time zone every six days. Um, it was just so it, I was just like so calculated the whole way I wanted like I wanted the record I didn't really think about anything else each day was kind of like I called it an episode like sometimes there would be um, different people to run with and so like each day when I went to bed I would like write down like just a one-liner for the day like title it like the epi like episode like 
running with Nathan today or some more creative. Um, so like, that was the cool thing is like, I can really remember like someone like mentioned, Oh, remember when we ran together? I'm like, Oh yeah, that was day 33. Like I could rattle it off right away or episode 33. Um, and, but then, you know, flat, go ahead to key to key transcon there was no consistency whatsoever because I was basically running until I had a good place to sleep because I didn't have an RV. And so I didn't like camping very much, um, to be honest. Like it was always really cold at night. I didn't have a sleeping pad. Um, so I just kind of called that like the penalty box where I would just set up my tent and like lay there, not sleeping for a few hours and then get back on the road. Um, so like I, there would be some days where I would do you know, over 70 miles. And then there would be some days where I only did like 20 or 30 miles. And I think it averaged out to like 55, but it was more of like, I, I thought it was really, I thought it was kind of fun. Like it was kind of like a video game rather than a TV show of episodes. Like it was, you know, each stage of the video game, you have to get through each stage to get on to the next, the next uh, level. Um, and that was kind of the way I, I kind of thought of that run. Like I want to keep unlocking each stage. So I just got to keep not make, making any mistakes uh, like I did on the first transcon where I had to take a day off. And so I actually did, you know, I executed it perfectly um, as far as like what day, you know, I wanted to finish on day 99 in Key West and I finished on day 99 in Key West. And so like it, it was pretty remarkable how, you know, how much went right considering um, how much could have gone wrong when you're the only one out there, you know, basically just making sure you don't screw anything up. <laughs> so, so let's uh, just get this in everyone who's listening into this. So you're running from Alaska to Florida, you're pushing a stroller, you're going to sleep outside every night. Yeah. Uh, in the tent. You're oh, I just, I only camped a few times. I actually, okay. I, yeah, I would usually stay. And that was why like some days on the Alaska highway, it was like, all right, do 75 miles a day to get to this lodge and okay. then do 15 miles the next day type of thing. Got it. And then you would have your food with you um, throughout and then you would replenish at each stop. So you'd have food for the next day. Yep. Yep. I, you know, up there, you know, in Canada and Alaska, it was usually um, a lot of five days between uh, grocery store options. So like there'd be some times where I would just have a completely packed stroller mm. with calorie dense foods. <laughs> wow. And then, uh, so how was it evolving into pushing the stroller? Like that's not something any of us train. What was that like? Yeah, I, I worried a lot about that part because I didn't train. Um, I wanted to do about a thousand miles of training with a stroller um, before I started, but it actually turned out I only did maybe like a hundred, 150 miles because um, I had to ship it up we were actually in the process of moving and I had to ship it up to Alaska um, I'm over a month out. And so I was worried about my mechanics because I was, because you're the most efficient way I could, I could ever find was basically not really, um, uh, well, actually like, you know, doubling down on my swing of my right arm and then pushing with my left hand. And I thought I'd definitely get an, like an overuse injury doing that. Um, cause I, I have seen some people that put both hands on the, on the steering wheel and I, I can't do that. Um, but I, I, I definitely looked kind of silly when I started mm -hmm. out in Alaska, just like swinging one arm, it just felt really awkward. So thankfully I think I was going slow enough. Like I was doing, I wasn't doing, you know, any, I was going very methodical pace, um, like. 10 minute miles, you know, sometimes even slower. So I think that helped a lot with, with um, avoiding the injuries. Yeah. And I, and I hear you about the, the stroller. Like I've got three kids and they're all old, you know, my oldest is now 14. So you know, she's not in the stroller anymore. Uh, of course. Um, but you know, I've had many, many years of, of, and I'm exactly the same. You hold with your left and you swing with your right and you just angle your body, but your, your, your T-spine, your mid-back is not, it's not hinging the way it's supposed to hinge. Right. And yep. so, 
Yeah, I was. I had a number of different injuries with with running with uh, the stroller um, as well. Too any 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 mechanical issues with the stroller? Any any big blow ups, tires, uh, joints within the stroller itself? I was really lucky. Um, I didn't. You know, I didn't come in with a very good plan. I didn't have any backup tires. Like I did have some backup. Um, some backup. Uh, what do you call them? That you put in uh, to. <laughs> yeah. um, but I didn't like I didn't come out because because I noticed like the Alaska Highway has some very rough road and mm -hmm. um, I was really nervous like I was just like praying every day like please please don't like don't like puncture my tire completely like because eventually um, I think like around every 1500 to 2000 miles I would have to just change out the tires completely because they would just become so warped um, with all the weight, all the extra weight that I was putting in the stroller that probably wasn't recommended. Um, yeah, it was, I was lucky because the only time I would have, there were two things I needed shipped to me along the route. Um, that was shoes and tires um, because I just wasn't going to be able to find them anywhere along the route. On, on a regular basis. Um, but yeah, the, my, my sister sent me some tires and I remember there was this, I think it was a second shipment of tires um, in Southern Canada. And I was literally, I, I kid you not, I was, I was running on a warped tire for a couple of days and it was like, Oh my God. Just the, the tire was just completely warped. So I could hear it every time and it would just get louder and louder, like a dump, the, a dump, balance. A dump, a dump, huh? wow. And and I remember I was getting really worried. And then eventually I thought I heard a gunshot and my tire just exploded because there was all this pressure um, on a certain part of the tire. And I was laughing because I was literally, I think I was like, and I, was, I was like 42 miles away from being done for the day. And then I had like a 58 mile day the next day. And at that end of that 58 miles, that hotel was holding s some new tires for me that my sister had shipped. So I was exactly a hundred miles away from where I needed to be to get a, a fresh tire. So what I did was I actually still had one of my old flat tires. So I put the flat tire back on. So I had two flat tires. And it actually wasn't that bad. I was pushing the stroller on just two completely flat tires for a hundred miles. No, <laughs> it on. wasn't. It really wasn't that bad. It was just oh, no. really yeah. weird. Um, just a really weird story. Well, I think that that you you saying that that's not really all that bad. I think that would be terrible for everybody else. Yeah. Um, but but for you, Pete, you know, with your frame of mind, and you're like, meh. What the heck? Yes, this is this is what we're doing. <laughs> This is, this is the best that we got, right? <laughs> well, I, so I didn't complain. So I, I posted on like Instagram every day, like how my day went. And like, I just, I remember that day I was like, I, I was so upset about something. I couldn't mention it. And then the next day when I got to the, the hotel with the tires, I did mention that day on this, on my post was here's what happened like yesterday that I didn't tell you about. And, uh, you know, I showed a photo of the two flat tires and, but then at the end, I was like, the only reason I didn't, I didn't complain about it the whole time was because I knew I've seen people do ultras where they're literally sleeping. I, I think I like, you know, Courtney Dahlwalter sleeping for like two minutes doing 240 miles in the Moab and a couple other friends. And I was just like, you know, and I was like, what would they do? And that, that was like my whole motto for those two days is like, this is nothing compared to other things. So, so yeah, you know, when you go back to sort of your, <clears throat> trips from Iowa out to the mountains and you're traveling and so you now travel just by running across the country in different directions do you sort of like really appreciate the diversity of what you see and the people you meet there's some real memorable parts of it and then there's the monotonous part I mean how does that play out for you yeah absolutely um that's, that was the, I think that was the coolest thing. Well, one of the coolest things of um, Alaska, Florida was, it was just such a diverse landscape, diverse accents, diverse crop. So the whole time I like going from North to South, I was basically running in like harvest season everywhere. And so it was just really cool. Like it was like, I call it the tour de harvest because it was just like, I was seeing like all these different crops that I'd, you know, 
growing up in Iowa, it's basically corn and soybeans. I saw pecans, I saw cotton, I saw peanuts, I saw canola, wheat, just like everything you can see. Yeah. When I started, I, was, I met uh, this guy named Mike who was literally, he was putting his boat in to go like deep sea fishing and then, and then you know, up in Alaska and then down in Key West the opposite type of fishing. So it was just, yeah, it was really cool. Like, mm. you know, meeting so many different people as well, obviously that have just completely different backgrounds and meeting people, you know, of all ages as well. So yeah, that's, I think that's, that's what I, I love, you know, about these things is you see it's all one run, but you get to see things that are almost, you know, totally different side of the world to each other. Yeah. yeah, just such a cool, you know, life experience, right? And that's what I'm, I'm taking from what, what you're saying about, um, you know, you're, you're, you're very curious. You, you like looking around and meeting people and having new experiences and, and observing. And, you know, the, the, the difficult thing about ultra marathoning, I find, is that, you know, even, even take a hundred mile rates, um, is the mental state of being okay in the moment and with whatever's going on. And as you even say, you know, running for a hundred miles on a flat tire in the middle of Southern Canada and you're a hell of a long ways away. Those moments would make the vast majority of people, if not even some of the, the best ultra marathoners crumble. But yeah, you kind of look at it and go, meh, you know, like what, what, what are you going to do? Right. And I think that that right there is, is, is kind of a key piece of what makes you Pete uh, as successful as you are. So any little nuggets about that, you know, any, any, any advice you'd give a lot of runners into, you know, how to take those, those, those things that are going wrong or, or how you perceive something and turning it into a relative positive, any, any nuggets you can give the, the audience? Yeah. You know, I think it's, um, I think it's just meeting, you know, I've, I've been so lucky to meet so many different people with different attitudes and different things. And so like, you always try to take like the best of each of them. Um, like there was a guy, uh, a friend of mine, and he's, I think 72, 73 years old. Um, he lives, his name is Bjorn Sennison and he's run across the U S um, I think like six or seven times. <laughs> and he's done all of those, I think, since he was, he was turned 60. So he's, um, he does it basically every other year and he averages, you know, he averages, you know, 50 kilometers a day or more when he does these things. And he never, he's never screwed up. Like he's, he's done, he's run across the, the U S a hundred days. I think every time he's just perfectly on schedule. He, and so I got, I got to run with him and when he came through Nebraska, uh, several years ago and he was kind of part of my inspiration you know before I ever did a transcon but just meeting like just being willing to stop and see someone like that on the road along the road and I actually like I, I had heard that he was um coming through town and I literally like he didn't have a live tracking back then and I I literally like scouted out different towns that he might be in before I finally found his stroller at a bar um, you know, he was having a, a lunch there and I walked in and I just like, I introduced myself and I was, I was kind of nervous, but like, you know, he's just chilling in the back of the bar eating a burger or something. And it was just, you know, things like that. Like, I think I've, you know, if you really want to do something, you're going to seek out the right people, but then you're also going to spend the time to learn how they did it, you know, read through their notes or whatever they're willing to share. And so I think that's, that's the big thing is, you know, I tried to be like Bjorn, uh, especially with key to key, because he, he does all of his runs uh, with, a, with a stroller. Um, so I think that, I think that's the biggest thing is just being willing to learn from other people, but then also your own thing, like my high mileage training, I never really picked that up from anyone in particular. I kind of just ran with it and uh, literally, and just kind of made it my own. So you know, I think it's, it's also, it's just a big mixture in my opinion of being outside the box and willing to try new things, um, being willing to screw up, but then also, you know, surrounding yourself by smart people. So, you know, so as Dave says, you're, you're arguably the best multi-day runner in the world. Uh, 
and you have some sponsorship arrangement with, I think, Hoka, uh, and then, but you have to work a full-time job. And, you know, you have a full-time job called running. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, in most sports, uh, if you're at the top of your game, you know, you, it's not like, you know, the game isn't enough, but they don't usually then go do a desk job. Uh, you know, any, you know, and you're still a young guy, you know, so you have plenty of life ahead of you, but anytime, what, what, what is that like, you know, to have to sort of really, in some sense, Pete has two full-time jobs, you know, he, he's a professional runner at the top of the game, literally. And then you have to then do the white collar thing. I mean, we can say, yeah, that's good because I'm interested in doing stuff during the day, but how, how does that play out? And, and should our sport, you know, evolve a little bit more so we can support runners better uh, when they want to seek, you know, setting real marks in the industry and in the sport? Yeah, you, you know, I, it's tricky. Um, because, you know, when you look at across running there, you know, there, there is even really any distance of running, you know, even, even if you're a world-class marathoner, you know, unless you're, unless you're really, you know, maybe one of a dozen and the, I don't know, that's just kind Chogi of. Chogi probably, he probably has a reasonable sponsorship, I think at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're right. Yeah. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, all across running at every level, it's, it's, it's a, it's a hard sport to, but then, um, I think that also though, I mean, well, for me personally, and, you know, not anyone else, I think a day job keeps me out of trouble. So that's probably a good thing. For me. <laughs> but aside from that, um, I think, you know, I, I think it's kind of good in some ways in ultra running because it means you really want to be there and you really want to do it. Um, like, I think if, like, I'm just thinking like, if you, you know, I love to watch all sports, like I'll watch, you know, the, the NBA and major league baseball or NFL or, or soccer. And, you know, a lot of those people there probably wouldn't be there if, if it weren't for the money. And so I think that's what makes our sport so great is, you know, I'd love there to be more money. I'd love to see more people, you know, be able to make a living off it. But I think also it's kind of, it's kind of cool that, um, you know, and, 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 and I, I talked to a friend of mine, um, Doug Barnett, a lot about this because he is a huge fan of races like Badwater and um, just really any ultra, but he, he comes out to Badwater, you know, every summer. Um, and he just loves to see it. He just, he just loves to be a part of, you know, someone's crew and help them because he says this is because, you know, he, he tells me this, you don't see much stuff in life that's real that you know is real in front of you and you know ultra running and and running is is completely legitimate you know as long as someone's not taking some crazy juice but hopefully we have good good protocols to catch that yeah no and i i agree pete um just to kind of you know forward what, what you just said about um you know having a daytime job is, is yeah, I, I think is quite a good thing for myself and you and, and, and a lot of the other runners that I know. Um, because the, the problem with our sport, I think, is enough is never enough. You know, we, we'll, we'll just keep running until our, our legs wear down and we have nubs at our knees. And so, you know, the fact that you have to go and, and, and work the next day um, or you have other responsibilities in life, and I think it's, it's a good thing and it certainly puts – puts a time restraint on, on what we can, what we can do. So I, I agree to that. But, you know, I wanted to touch base on, on races and, and one thing that I haven't really seen you do too, too much on, I end up putting on this quarantine backyard race um, this past year and you, you uh, participated. Um, but, you know, the backyard style racing, you know, Pete, I've always thought that you would dominate at backyard style racing. Is that something that you want to do more of in, in years to come? I do. I do. Yeah. I do. I love the concept of it and it was fun you know, even though I only lasted I think like 105 miles it um the one you put on it was I loved it I just the only thing that gets me is I get scared like you know with my transcon runs like I plan down to almost embarrassingly minuscule details and sometimes I don't but I I do often and like I'll I'll really hone that in with a backyard. There is no 
planning that you can do as far as how long you're going to be running. And so I, I do want to do one like, like, like an in-person one, but it's just, I don't, it's, it's never been the top of my list because I get freaked out by, um, not knowing if you're going to be running for 150 miles or if you're going to be running for 350 miles. <laughs> right. Yeah. There is no end to the race. And, that, so, and that, you're right. That does freak a lot of people out. That's the so diabolical and, nature of it. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. Like, I think I need to work on my ability to become less um, frazzled on race day because like I, I don't get frazzled on when I go into a race usually because I know what to expect, but like with something like that, where, it's you, it's a given that it's going to be um, unpredictable is something I had to have to work on. Yeah, I think there's some intrigue in that, you know, and I, I think this whole idea of, uh, you know, we'll call it living a full life. So yeah, you're working during the day, you're running, you're doing two things, and you're using up your 168 hours in a week in a in a great way. You know, like they're all purposeful for Pete or Dave or any of us who are sort of in this sport. Um, and, but that's part of what the fun of this journey is, is to try and go figure that out, right? Pete overcame the idea that it's darn intimidating to run 70 miles a day. You know, that's intimidating, but you got over that. And so, you know, that strength of mental character can, you know, make you be curious about this one. You know, we always talk about people who achieve the most in this planet are the ones who intersect curiosity and courage. You know, you really want to know, but then you have that sort of will to go do it. And that's when we find out a lot because there's sort of something further than the edge of what we've been able to sort of accomplish. And what I also like thematically is that ultra runners are a class that I define as people who don't ask permission. You know, we just go do things. You know, we're not looking for someone to either approve or ask them if it's okay, you know? And I think it brings this really interesting dynamic that's happened. You know, ultra running started as the most fringe activity. And now we're starting to track people doing it. And it's fun, you know, and got Laz getting 20,000 people running a virtual race across Tennessee. And now, you know, you're setting out to do big things. So, um, so we, we encourage you, but sort of, you know, if there's a question in there, it's, you know, you're usually all endurance stuff you get, better as you get older because the mental piece comes together. Um, do you feel that, that you're getting stronger mentally as you go along and that, you know, whatever Pete's going to set out to do, which we'll hear about before we're done, uh, is working in your favor, helping you get better at this? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think, you know, you, you look at the people that, win ultras and i'm not talking about like necessarily maybe the most competitive ones although you could also argue that in some cases they're all i mean it's you go to any 100 mile race and i mean you don't you don't you just don't see or i mean really any ultra race you don't see anyone knock it out of the park on the first try um or even the third try so yeah i, I think the mental piece is so important because it, everything you do in an ultra interacts with the mental piece. So, it, it, you know, it could be the, the nutrition, you have to be mentally um, experienced in that. It could be just your pace. Um, it could be to, you know, fix an issue before it becomes a problem or fix a potential problem before it becomes a problem. So, yeah, I, I think, I think it's, you're, that's what I think is cool about it is you be great at it for a long time um, because you you just you, it's it's just not it's just not all physical it's it, I mean it is physical but it you know I think Yogi Berra spoke it better than I can but you know you're just you're always going to you're never going to win a race in ultra running only on physical attributes Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So Pete, you know, what we're noticing as well too in the ultra marathoning world is the increasing fa uh, fascination with the, not the multi-day, but the multi-week events. Um, I think people love the idea of crossing a, a major land mass like America, the San Francisco to New York City run. Um, but, you know, I think that we're seeing 
you know, more and more people, record numbers every single year doing crossings. Um, and you were just alluding to, to some people who do it a handful of times in their life uh, or, or two handfuls of times. We're also seeing um, speedier and faster runners who are going to be making an attempt at, you know, to throw out a couple names and, and um, you know, Zach Bitter is, is looking to do it here soon, if not next year. Uh, Michael Wardian, um, fast as stink, you know, he's looking to do it, you know, next year. Um, you know, Pete, I, I still think that, you know, after next year, n you know, no offense to Michael or, or Zach, your record is still going to stand because it's, 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 it, that would be tough to break um, your, your standard that you set. So any words of advice? Um, the other cool thing, no, no, before I get to that, the other cool thing about the ultra marathoning world and including you, Pete, is um, most other sports wouldn't give the advice of how to break my record. I know you and I know that you would, you'd be honest and say, hey guys, do this and do this and, do, and don't do these different things. Those two characters, Michael Wardian and Zach Bitter, who um, are gonna put their best foot forward. Any advice to give them leading into, into them trying to break your record? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's a long, long haul. And just like any race, things are gonna go wrong, but it's, it's just multiplied by the number of ways that things can go wrong. Um, so I think, you know, you, you have to, I mean, for me, it was, I had a very good crew and I mean, that is paramount. I mean, you can do, I think you can do almost any, arguably any single day or even a multi-day race if it's a loop course um, with very, very little support if, if you're very mentally strong. But for something like that, there are going to be times where things will go wrong. There's going to be times where you think you're not going to maybe even finish let alone in the time you want to. So, you know, the crew part is really important. You know, for me personally, I can't, I, can't, I actually like the fact that my crew wasn't like close, um, like, like family, it was, you know, friends, but you know, not like people that, I mean, I'd actually just met them all that year when I did it. So, you know, I think it's just, you gotta be very intentional about how you're, who you're surrounding yourself with. Um, and, you know, and, and you're going to probably argue with each and every one of them. So do you, and you don't want to have too many people with you because the more people you have, the fewer people are accountable to helping you succeed. So, you know, I would say like, you know, you don't want to have, um, you know, it was fun to have a friend of mine on uh, come along for a while that took photos and then another friend that did a couple of days of video, but um, it was really just the four, four crew members and me, um, we, we had a routine, uh, we stuck to, we were very specific about what we were going to do every day. Um, you know, very military like, so, I mean, that, I think that's the best advice I can give is you just, you have to be very, uh, tuned into your routine and, um, how you go, you know, I think a lot of the rest is, you know, everybody has, you know, their way of recovering you know, their way of eating and things like that. But I think it's just, you know, the, the, crew, the framework of, of your crew is, and your daily routine is probably um, the biggest piece that I, I didn't appreciate going in. It's good advice. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it, there's lots of these, any of them that, that struggle is with yourself and with others and understanding that and have people can react is very, very important to, you know, sort of knowing when to walk away and let the things just sort of calm down. I mean, of course, Dave has had his experience in doing that. I'm sure he could tell you his crew is a big part of the success. Just, you know, I think the audience always loves to hear the struggle. So just on the, let's say going to Transcon, what was the hardest day? Like what what were like, did you get lots of blisters? Did your leg hurt, sunburn, hungry? Like what was, you know, that you really had to push through? Um, there was a, there were a few days. Um, the one, the, the day in the Yosemite National Park was, um, turned out to maybe be the most grueling and, and hurting. But like the end of the day, if I put like the hurts, the hurt um, uh, spectrum, that was probably the worst. Um, but there were days where I struggled sleeping. So I would say 
you know, those were maybe the toughest, mm -hmm. like just to get through um, from start to finish. Um, you know, sleeping can be a very difficult task, <laughs> especially when you know you're always on the clock. Um, I, I've always kind of struggled with that part of it. Like, you know, I, it take, usually takes me at least an hour to get, get to like a full, full sleep. So that's, that, that was always the toughest was, was days like that. Mm. Yeah. And I agree, Pete, you and I are very similar. We spoke about uh, six day uh, together and, you know, you, both you and I, I think we can end up putting in some good daily mileage when it comes to six days, but then you got to sleep. And knowing very well that that sleep is paramount, it, it gets rolling in your head, doesn't it? Yeah, it really, yeah. And it, yeah, it, it just, it becomes a mental battle. Like, cause, cause you, it, especially just the, on the, like, you know, if, if they stopped the clock and it was like a, you know, like a stage race where it's just your moving time, it would be much easier, I think for me, but just, just knowing that you're like, <laughs> you're, you're wasting your time when you're not sleeping. And then it just kind of, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes. Right, right. And to speak a little bit further to, um, you know, I know, Pete, this is your interview, but I'm going to, you know, just bring up a story about TransCanada. Um, yeah, bring it up. You know, and yeah, there were some, there were some, you know, terrible sleeping days, but the, my worst day was, um, you know, a tornado that blew through right near Medicine Hat in, in through Alberta. And, you know, the headwind was incredible that day. And, you know, I was about, 70 kilometers into the day, yeah, about 75 kilometers into the day. And I was keeping my eye on, on, a, weather, on a storm that was blowing in from the north. And you know, I called my crew and I said, did you, did you just see that? And because and, and, you know, it was a funnel cloud that was forming to the north. Hmm. And he said, yeah, I see it. And I'm, you know, look right behind you, I'm on you. So if that comes in, I'm gonna be on you. And, but I was keeping my eye to the north and from, to the south another cloud came in and brought just massive hail and it was unreal and immediately the rv pulls right, right in front of me and i dive into the rv thinking i'm gonna die and uh, you know we i just sat there you know eating soup thinking there's no way i'm not i'm not gonna my legs are fried because i had to run into a 75 kilometer an hour you know headwind all day oh. I, i'm done i'm done for the day but then i remember the rv stopped moving and it, it didn't, wasn't shaking back and forth, but the weather turned. So my crew, Wayne, has got out of the RV and he said, holy hell, Dave, you have to get out here because your 75 kilometer an hour headwind just turned into a 75 kilometer an hour tailwind. <laughs> and so I was the hat, all you had to do is pick up your knees, right? And you were like flying. Yep. And I think that day I ended up running an extra 20 kilometers or something. Nice. Uh, past what I wanted to do just simply because you're not going to ever get that that tailwind like that ever again yeah. in your life so it's funny it's it's amazing how those things turn around right yeah well it's funny you mentioned that because I didn't my actually right as you started talking about wind I thought about uh, my worst day at key to key and in um I think it was uh southern Minnesota one day I had the worst headwind I think and, and with a stroller it makes it like four times worse because you're pushing something into it. A sail. Creating all this drag. I'm not a physics professor, but, and then about, um, I remember I was gonna have dinner with actually my um, father-in-law and uh, um, my wife's uh, grandparents were gonna come have dinner with me where I finished and I was way behind schedule. And I was just getting really mad, like, like I was just so frustrated because I was going to be late for dinner. I was going to make, and that's the thing. Like, I really get abnormally concerned for like other people's schedules for some reason. Like when I'm doing things like this, because I feel really selfish. And so, anyways, long story short, I get about fifty out of fifty-five miles, say, done for the day, and the the wind like this front comes through and the wind completely turns around. And then all of a sudden I can't even keep up with my stroller the last five miles. <laughs> <laughs> the gods are playing with you guys, you know, yep. I think that's what happens and it's all part of the test as we go through this. So, yeah. So now you've had a bit of a, we won't call it a break of sorts here. The COVID situation certainly affecting all of us in you're keeping your training going. Are you, do you have any races left in this year or runs you're doing or what, what you got going on now? 
Yeah, I'd like to do, um, I might do a hundred mile, like a low key hundred miler in Pennsylvania um, next month if, uh, if, if I can be ready. And then um, later this year, I think in November, I'd like to do um, either go back to Tunnel Hill yeah. where, where you and I crossed paths last year. Yeah. Um, or um, do a 24 hour race in November. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to do some, you know, some, I was going to do Spartathlon, but then I just, you know, the, the race I think is still supposed to go on, but I just thought, you know, to get to Greece with all the loop, you know, loopholes you'd have to jump through to get to the race as an American. I just thought oh, I'll save it for another year. Yeah, um, that's probably a good idea. So, yeah. Maybe a couple more, a couple races I'd like to do this year, but mm -hmm. then, uh, both domestic. How about you guys? Well, yeah, I think uh, I think actually we have plans to be at Tunnel Hill. We're gonna see if we get back out there again this year. See what it's like. It's a great crew. It's a nicely run race. It's uh, low key enough. Uh, and you know, if you're if you're not a true trail runner, it's a great place to go do a fifty or a hundred and feel rather competent. So uh, versus some of the the mountain goats who are good at, uh, you know, up and down and in and around. So that's sort of the plan. Uh, yeah. So in this sort of the way we always end the podcast is a little bit about, you know, this idea of chasing tomorrow and big ideas that you might be working on. Uh, you know, Dave and I always think it's like the, it's the science and the sport of, you know, turning ordinary into extraordinary in life through the choices that we make. So, what are you uh, What are you thinking about for the next even twelve, twenty four months? Anything big for Pete? Yeah, you know, I I want to you know keep racing, but you know, I I have you know for years, for the last couple of years, really, I've thought about I'd love to do a run across Australia. So mm. um, I don't know, you know, we'll have to see if if everything aligns the way I would love it to, maybe in a year, but um, twenty twenty one or uh, maybe 2022 um, might be more well we'll see but yeah. um, just something I'd love to do you know I, I've the run across Australia is another big um, bucket for some people that are into the multi-week type stuff so um, I know a lot of really cool people in Australia that I've met over the years from doing these ultras which is one of the coolest things about doing some of these ultras. So yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to give that a try. Um, you know, from there, there are some people that are crazy and now I'm not as, I don't think I'd be this crazy, but there's some people that do the whole ring around Australia, which is like, I heard about that. I want to say 10,000 miles or so. Um, I'm not sure if I'd be up for that though. So, uh, you know, the, the standard route across Australia from, uh, Perth to Sydney is like, uh, 2,400 miles. So it'd be, you know, it'd be a solid month or more of getting up every day and heading east. <laughs> so we'll see. I'd love to do it. Yeah. That's so cool. I think about other people's buckets or bucket list items, Pete. And, you know, a lot of people are, I want to go, you know, ride horses in whatever country, or I want to go skiing here, or I want to go drink wine there. Um, for you, it's countries to run across. <laughs> and you know months to run or or entire summers um and that is so cool and i i i, I just get such a kick out of your curiosity of, of 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 ultimately the way to go see the world is to go and experience it by putting you know foot you know step by step uh literally mm -hmm. across that land and 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 i couldn't agree more with you than that that is really truly the way to experience uh, the world and really ultimately life and the things that you learn about yourself and and, and people as well too so i want to thank you pete for um for coming on our, our broadcast and and uh sharing your experiences you know i'm again joe we're so excited to have yeah. guys like pete and the world's best athletes uh coming on our podcast and being willing to to share your story so so thanks a million pete and um and yeah i hope you're uh, chasing tomorrow and um and and continue doing what you're doing thanks very much absolutely well thanks for the invite guys uh, it was a pleasure to join you yeah, well, we'll see you out on uh, we'll see you out on the road here soon enough, right? Absolutely. All right, thanks. <laughs> Take care. See you guys.